Good evening and welcome to the virtual Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Will Frankel and I'm one of your three Athenaeum fellows this year. Elections have consequences. According to the National Bureau of Economic Research, 12 state governors' decision not to participate in Medicaid expansion in their states has led to 15,600 additional deaths relative to if those governors had accepted federal funds to expand the program. Oxford University data suggests that if the United States had implemented similar coronavirus response policies in March to its international peers, somewhere between 70% and 99% of our 200,000 confirmed coronavirus deaths could have been averted. European social scientists found that moving from full Republican control to full Democratic control of a US state legislature is associated with a 35 percentage point increase in income taxes as a share of personal income. And because of presidential and senatorial election outcomes over the past six years, Roe versus Wade might soon be overturned. Despite these life and death implications of some candidates getting more votes than others, Tonight's speaker argues that the first Tuesday in November need not be sacred for all of us. It is okay, she believes, not to vote. Catherine Mangy Ward is editor-in-chief of Reason. She started as a Reason intern in 2000 and has worked at the Weekly Standard and the New York Times. Mangy Ward is a graduate of Yale University where she received a bachelor's degree in philosophy and political science. At Reason, she leads a publication that covers issues important to libertarian values. Her writing has included commentary on the ethics of non-voting, job automation, and plastic bag bans. She's a co-host of the Reason Roundtable podcast. Ms. Mangu Ward will start with a presentation of her argument, and then we will ask some of our questions and some of yours. Using the written Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, we will be accepting questions throughout the program to be posed towards the end of the event. Preference will go to students, so when you send a question, please state your affiliation with the college. Ms. Mangu Ward's Athenaeum presentation is co-sponsored with funding from the Open Academy at CMC. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. And now, please join me in welcoming Catherine Mangu Ward to the Athenaeum. Thank you very much, Will. I'm so happy to be here, though I wish I could be somewhere uh, with those of you who are participating today. I think uh, particularly when we're talking about controversial topics where feelings are running high, uh, it, it's really so much better to be together in person and uh, and to be able to kind of relate as human beings, but we will do our best with the Zoom tools that we have available. Um, so obviously the topic here is purposely controversial. It's, it's a difficult subject to talk about, and it's one that I think is best to take head on. I appreciated Will's introduction. I think he makes absolutely excellent points. Elections, of course, have consequences. Politics are important. They are central to our lives as well as peripheral to many elements of our lives. They are everywhere, all around us. I'm a political journalist. I obviously believe that elections have consequences and it's important to think and talk and act on a political level. However, my case to you tonight, uh, and the case that I've been making for years in Reason Magazine, at Reason.com, Reason Podcast, Reason Videos, is that voting as the sort of central political act is a misunderstanding of how we should interact with politics and with each other and is kind of systematically overrated for reasons that I just want to go through one by one. So I'm going to raise what I think are the strongest arguments against my claim that it's okay not to vote and try to knock those down. But I'm sure that in the Q&A, I will hear from many of you with more arguments or restatements of those arguments that strengthen them. And I'm really looking forward to that. So I want to start just at the very beginning with uh, you know, the idea that the case for voting, which we are accustomed to hearing, is sometimes a kind of background noise. It's just taken for granted. I mean, here in Washington, DC, obviously a lot of political junkies, a lot of people walking around wearing face masks that say vote right now. It's just ubiquitous. And so it's completely understandable that our intuitions and that our kind of moral sense would be that this is just naturally a good act. I wanna challenge that. Uh, on a bunch of levels, on a kind of a factual level, on level of a, a proper understanding of our duties as citizens, on a proper perception of our, our own self-worth and our ability to make impact in various ways. Uh, I do think there are some good reasons for some people to vote some of the time, but I think there are a lot more bad reasons and the bad reasons are more popular. So let's start with just the absolute basic. 
every vote counts. Your vote will almost certainly not determine the outcome of a public election. I'm not here talking about conspiracy theories about rigged elections, malfunctioning voting machines. You would be forgiven for sure for thinking that is what I'm talking about given the tenor of our current political debate. Of course, the fact that these things can happen and do happen, that sometimes elections are rigged, is one more reason why your vote doesn't necessarily count. But I actually want to set that aside and just talk on a very basic level about math. This is something that I find, even though it should be the kind of simplest and most straightforward part of the argument, often makes people the most upset. So let's just do some basic numbers. Um, there's a really good study done in 2001 by the National Bureau of, by National Bureau of Economics Research paper by economists Casey Mulligan and Charles Hunter. They looked at uh, 56,613 contested races going all the way back to 1898. What they found was that there was one contest at the congressional level, a 1910 race in Buffalo, where there seems to have truly been a single vote margin. That's in a, a century worth of congressional races. There are tight races, they exist, but those again are not a single vote race. The question, does your vote determine the election, is a mathematical one. And the answer is simply that it is wildly unlikely, like Powerball, mega lotto <laughs> unlikely to determine the election. And I think that's something that um, even people who are very statistically literate and who think of themselves as being influenced by a proper understanding of probabilities are reluctant to accept, to accept, again, because we get constant messaging about how likely and important it is that your vote will matter. Next point I wanna to get to is the idea of voting as a civic duty. So, I mean, this I think is actually a more powerful argument. Um, you know, we can say, okay, mathematically, no individual vote is likely to determine the outcome of an election, nor is it necessarily likely to materially benefit that voter, but shouldn't we still have an obligation to participate in civic culture, to participate in our democracy in some form? And I think that this is, you know, this is a more powerful argument, not least because um, it leans into the idea that all people, all citizens are equal and that they are participants in our government and in our democracy. Uh, while I think that that is a noble ideal, I also think that there is a, a question of when we are increasing quantity but not quality of voters. Now again, I wanna be very, very clear about what I am not arguing. I am definitely not arguing here that we should in any way suppress voting, that anyone should be denied the franchise, that there should be any kind of test or poll tax or limit put on accessibility to the polls. That is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about individual decision-making about participation in elections. This is where we get into the idea of the informed voter. So we often talk about public education as being core to producing an educated citizenry. Why do we need an educated citizenry? Because we're a democracy, people vote. Uh, so here's then the question, is your vote likely to bring up the average of the voting pool? If you believe that your vote is likely to be ill-informed or more importantly, that you will bring down the average of informed voters, it may actually be your duty to refrain from voting. If you are not a well-informed voter, it may in fact be the right thing for you to do personally is to choose to refrain, to participate in the political process in other ways, including perhaps using the time you would have used to vote to get informed. This is, I think, uh, an argument that pushes against sort of a feeling that many people have that um, participation itself is a good, but I think in most activities, most types of activities, we say participation where you increase the quality of the outcome, participation where you make things better is what's morally laudable, is what's your duty to do in some cases. Um, your sense of yourself as an informed voter is also a difficult question. Now, if you're participating in this forum, you are almost certainly an above average voter. So I think that that is, you know, a reasonable self-assessment for most people here. You're probably closer to the top than the bottom of the information distribution. However, you still have this knowledge gap problem, which is that you have very little knowledge about what a politician will actually do once you send him or her to Washington. So the gap between promised and real consequences of electing a particular candidate 
is incredibly substantial. Even if you are a well-informed voter, your ability to predict what your candidate will do once he takes office is limited, to say the least. Now, a subspecies of this argument, just to kind of highlight it, since I think it's relevant after watching the debate last night, is the argument, don't vote, it only encourages the bastards. We've probably seen that bumper sticker on someone's dad's car. Um, this is, uh, I actually think, a weirdly compelling argument. Um, and I want to kind of take a sidebar to talk about it. Essentially, the question is, do you think that the system in which you're participating is fair and just? If you don't, then there may be a duty or an obligation to refrain from participating in it. This is something that the Georgetown philosopher Jason Brennan calls the clean hands principle. You should not participate in activities where you think that you will, you will contribute to the harm and where the cost of refraining from that activity is low. It is, of course, a very low cost to refrain from voting. And if you think, as, as I do, and I think as many people do, that the system from, from all over the spectrum, that the system is rigged, that we are being presented with unappealing candidates, that uh, none of them genuinely genuinely represent your views and that in fact they will do morally condemnable things if they take office then it actually may be morally incumbent upon you it may be your duty to refrain from voting and i think that that's something that again is easy to either kind of bumper stickerize or dismiss but it's a pretty powerful moral argument so the next argument to talk about quickly is the sort of kantian one the categorical imperative well okay, maybe it's okay for one person not to vote, but what if everyone stops voting? Again, a totally natural and intuitive concern. This is the force behind the golden rule and many, many other moral systems. But there's no real reason to think that one person's choice not to vote or even to make a speech about not voting, hypothetically, will dramatically alter behavior at the level that delegitimates the system. Now, I'm perfectly willing to tweak my rule here. So, I'm gonna say most people shouldn't vote most of the time. However, if you have a strong reason to believe that you personally, your single vote, will affect the outcome of the election, and you think you are an educated voter, feel free to vote. That basically means my rule is saying, like, vote in PTA elections, but keep in mind that the presidential contest is simply not going to be uh, a case where this applies, nor will almost any down ballot race in a major election. Finally, most importantly, I want to get into the, if you don't vote, you can't complain. I am someone who complains about politics, policy, and politicians for a living. The prohibition on complaining by non-voters strikes very close to home for me. And I think, uh, you know, this, this idea, again, very intuitive, very natural. We think if someone invests in an enterprise, if they participate in a group project, they're they have more right than an outsider to determine the outcourse of that project. It's, it's sort of a, a thing that we feel in our everyday lives. And voting feels like an investment. It takes time. It perhaps costs you money. But I think it is incredibly pernicious to suggest that if you don't vote, you are then become ineligible to, to complain or to kind of speak about politics. In fact, um, Herbert Spencer quite nicely sums up in this argument in 1851 when he describes the fact that if you vote, then you are understood to have assented to the system, what we were talking about before, the idea of participating in a system uh, as a way of giving it moral sanction. So if you voted, regardless of whether your guy won, you have assented to the outcome because you participated. But if you don't participate, regardless of whether your guy won, you've assented to the outcome because you didn't participate. Somehow, curiously, no matter what we do, we have somehow assented to the outcome. I don't think that that's a good way to think about it. Uh, there may or may not be a duty to be civically engaged, to be a good citizen. This is a separate question from the question of voting. But if such a duty exists, there are so many ways to perform it, including and maybe especially complaining. Your time used complaining about politics, talking about politics, getting better informed so that your complaints will be more compelling, these are all incredibly important ways to engage in the political process. It is unrelated to any hypothetical duty to vote. It was ensured instead by the founders, all of whom were extraordinary belly acres themselves and who loved to whine about everything. I'm gonna wrap up just on the idea that voting is fun. This is something that I actually hear most 
from people who otherwise will grant all of these other points. There are people who will say, you know what, I get it. Like my vote's not gonna determine the election. Our election system is kind of bad and corrupt in a bunch of ways. I don't actually know very much about the down ballot races and I'm gonna complain no matter what, but I like the aesthetic experience of voting. I like to go, I like to be part of my community, I like to see other people participating. This to me gets the closest to an acceptable justification for voting. It's voting as a leisure activity. If you like it, go ahead, feel free. Um, but understand that this is, I think the best analogy for this is something like, if you are a fan of a sports team and you're cheering for that team, you enjoy it. You feel like you're a part of a community but you are not determining the outcome of what happens on the field. That is larger forces than the single voice that you raise in the stands. It doesn't mean that sports don't matter. It doesn't mean that uh, yeah, it's irrelevant who wins. I don't believe that at all. I think politics matters so much. I think that who wins matters so much in an election, but I think it's really, really important just to be right thinking and clear headed people and also to balance how we use our time and think about our priorities to understand that voting is not the be all and end all of political participation and to believe that it is, is ultimately somewhat poisonous and dangerous to our proper understanding of democracy. So I am delighted to take your outraged questions now because that's usually how this goes and I hope we can have a productive dialogue. Thanks for coming to the app. Um, so my first question starts with the 2016 election. It is accepted that fewer than 80,000 votes from the states of Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin secured Trump the presidency. This has had serious implications for the Supreme Court, where Trump could potentially appoint three justices in the Supreme Court in three and a half years, um, shifting the court to the right, with John Roberts now considered to be on the left of the court. This could really have some serious implications to access to healthcare and abortion rights. So how can we equate voting as an inflation of our sense of self when it has real repercussions for people who may not be as privileged as yourself? Right, so again, I just wanna repeat where I started and where I ended my remarks, which is that you're completely right. It very much matters who wins elections. But the margin that you just cited there was tens of thousands of people. What I am asking is, you as a moral individual, as someone who wants to do the right thing, who believes that politics matter and that your country is important and that the direction it heads is important, is it morally incumbent upon you to vote? Or is it in fact morally incumbent upon you to participate in ways that might be, even just if we're talking about, you know, how long does it take you to vote? An hour, half an hour, you know, it depends on whether you're standing in line or mailing it in. Obviously for some people, the time investment in voting is greater and actually, on average, though there's a huge amount of variability in this, people who uh, are in discriminated against populations, who are in, um, are in minority neighborhoods tend to have to invest more time in voting. We are asking more of people who have less to spare. And I think it's, I think it's a useful message and an appropriate one to say, hey, you know what? Like talking with your uncle at the barbecue for an hour or tweeting or writing a letter to the editor is gonna be a much better use of your time if you believe, as I do, the politics matter. I just, I think it's very, very important not to conflate the act of marching into a polling place or sending off your mail-in ballot with having done enough, with having done your duty as a citizen. I just don't, I think it's, I think we frequently lazily conflate those and I want us to be careful not to do that. Thanks. I want to ask a question that's a little bit direct and then I'm going to give a little bit of explanation what I mean by it. Uh, I'm wondering whether you litter in public places and specifically I'm wondering whether you litter in places that are already being poorly maintained uh, such that the odds of your particular contribution of trash aren't going to be decisive and anyone else enjoying the space any less. Uh, it's infinitesimally small that your particular contribution of trash is meaningful. Uh, it seems like your argument would justify that you have, if you have literally anything else better to do than walking over to a trash can, that it's okay to just throw your litter down in a public space and can contribute to the degradation of a public good. So there's actually a great rebuttal to this in the work of Jason Brennan, who I referenced earlier. He's the Georgetown philosopher who's written actually quite a lot about um, ethical questions around political participation in general. And this example actually comes across as like I'm going to see your, com your comparison and raise it to a more outlandish one, uh, but I hope that you'll see where I'm going with it, um, which is 
he says, okay, here's a terrifying thought experiment. Imagine that you come across a firing squad that is about to kill an innocent person, a child. Like make, make it however extreme you want in the example. Assume that all the bullets will strike at the same time and that there's nothing you can do to stop this firing squad from carrying out its grim duty. You are invited to be the 101st member of the squad. What do you say? And Brennan says, listen, here's how you deal with that hypothetical. That is the clean hands principle, that when there is very little cost to you to refrain from a harmful activity, you should not participate in a collectively harmful activity. And I think that's a very good rule. I think that covers the littering example. And I think it covers um, actually quite a lot of, um, you know, concentrated cost of use benefits and other kind of public goods concerns. Um, you know, I, I don't litter because I, it takes very, very, very little for me to not litter. And I recognize that it's a harm. I recognize that I'm causing harm. I would not participate in the firing squad. I would not throw my Snickers bar wrapper on the ground because I recognize it's a harm. I'm a moral person. I don't think voting maps onto that cleanly again because by not voting or voting like there's no there's no bullet there's no snickers wrapper of actual impact in the world in the voting example okay thank you um so thinking about someone um or thinking about what kind of your terms of a well-informed voter um, so what if someone who's not necessarily a well-informed voter by your definition, um, but is deeply compelled by a candidate running for office, um, chooses to vote, is that, um, do they have some sort of justification to vote or is it still kind of under that logic of, um, because of these terms and their vote doesn't really matter, um, they shouldn't vote or it's okay for them not to vote? Yeah, I mean, I actually think that's a great question and it gets into this entire really fascinating body of literature about, you know, are we the, are we the rider on the elephant or are we the elephant, right? I mean, this, this sort of question of um, many of our most cherished and carefully formed seemingly rational views are actually post hoc rationalizations for something that our gut told us or for something that's in our personality. It's just a feeling that we have or it's a cultural imperative, and then humans are rationalizing animals, and we do a great job of building up the whole thing. Oh well, I want to vote for Biden because you know I think that he will, you know, do X, Y, and Z policy things, and, da, 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 and I can have like a big long list. But maybe actually I just kind of like the guy, and we're not very good as humans, as creatures. We are not very good at knowing what thing is really motivating us. So, you know, I think lots and lots of people vote in in a way that's that's like this scenario that you're describing chris that they just sort of say this guy seems good the other guy seems bad and i i feel good about the good guy and i'm going to go give him my vote now again i think it's important to you know to note just as i am saying your vote is not going to determine the outcome of the election therefore it is not morally imperative that you vote i also your vote is not going to include the outcome of the election, so it's, it doesn't matter if you vote badly. Um, and I think that, you know, that is, that argument works in both directions. So when I say it might be morally incumbent upon you not to vote, um, these are still relatively small moral imperatives, right? Like these are not on the level of thou shalt not kill. Um, these, are, these are sort of smaller sins of either commission or omission. Um, and I think you know, that's what I'm trying to argue here is that like this sense of like, if you don't vote, you like Ruth Bader Ginsburg died for nothing. Like that's, that's a failure. That's a failure of kind of context and perception and self-awareness. And that's, that's what I'm trying to kind of inject into the conversation um, to the deep and abiding annoyance of many people who feel that, that it is an important thing to do um, and that the arguments for doing it are, are strong. A lot of um, low income and lesser privileged individuals vote to be seen by their government. So what can Americans do besides voting to be seen by their government? And can you give us some examples of political participation that you were referring to prior besides voting? Sure. So, I mean, one answer is something that has been knocking on my door for the last, you know, three weeks, which is the census. Um, I think there's a fundamental level of being seen, which is the level of being counted, not as a voter, but as a citizen. 
um, to answer to answer the census and respond to it is something that um, is a is a similarly tiny act, which arguably will have more influence. There is a dollar figure attached to your census answer that goes to your district or to your neighborhood school or whatever it is. So I think um, that's like the, the smallest, tiniest, lowest level answer. And of course, you would be right to say, yeah, the census systematically undercounts those same populations. It's a huge problem. I live in DC where we are underrepresented in a bunch of different ways, um, including of course, not having formal representation in Congress. Um, and, you know, so that's the kind of lowest level, but of course, there's a, you know a thousand ways to stack on top. You know the classic write a letter to the editor, which, as someone who has edited letters to the editor pages in my day, who has fielded many a letter to the editor during my editorships of various publications, I think it's it can be easy to dismiss that and its sort of modern proxies, which is you know tweeting, posting, you know like saving the world through graphic design on your Instagram all that kind of stuff, like it, that can feel like annoying forms of expression, right? Like I get that to sort of trade off between this like thing that has been sold to us as a solemn civic duty with a more kind of performative and potentially socially grading type of activism can feel like a bad trade off. But I actually think a lot of, a lot of our political hope lies in understanding each other better, talking to each other, talking to people who live near us, people who are part of our communities and we actually have a piece in the current issue of Reason. I'm not actually sure if it's live online yet, but I can check and send you all links later if you have some kind of server to distribute that on. Um, people are becoming increasingly um, bifurcated. This is not news, right? People are polarized. They live in their bubbles. Um, it is increasingly true that the way you vote is also a good predictor of what grocery store you shop at or what sports you like or what zip code you live in. Um, this was not always the case. I'm in general skeptical of stories about golden ages, but I do think this is a place where we are in decline and it is this polarization issue. Um, so I think like making friends with someone who disagrees with you politically is probably doing more to improve political outcomes in this country than voting, just as an example. I want to walk through now uh, some of the rational choice of voting and kind of the theory that goes into that. Uh, and if you'll indulge in uh, really a little bit more of a mathematical way. Uh, so you presented the really slim odds that any one vote will be decisive, but it seems to me that when you consider how high the stakes are in certain elections, that that can still make a perfectly good case for voting. Uh, it, let's just for the sake of argument, take the 99% of coronavirus deaths could have been averted in the US number seriously. Uh, the statistic that you have quoted in some of your writing is that in a presidential election, it's one in 60 million chances that your vote will be decisive in a presidential election. If you live in a swing state like me, as your writing is conceded, it's actually quite a bit higher than that. But let's just go with 60 million. So uh, multiply the 200,000 lives that could have been saved potentially by different policies by a conventional value of a statistical life in the US, which is about $9 million. Uh, just to put it in round terms, that gives you a value of the election just in coronavirus deaths terms of $1.8 trillion. And then you divide that by your one in 60 million chance of having a decisive vote. And that gives you, as long as my math is right, and you can correct me if it's wrong, a vote worth $30,000. And I promise you that in the time that I will fill out my vote by mail, it will, I could not be doing anything worth more than $30,000 to the country. Uh, shouldn't I vote? I don't know. Well, I don't think you should sell yourself short. I'm sure you can find something to do with that hour worth 30k. Um, no, so I, this this I think like I appreciate your question because I think it is a good way to engage on that first point that I made. Just the raw, you know, math of voting and does it matter? Um, in things that I've written about this, there actually is a body of academic literature that tries to do this same math. Um, it often does it um, with a. Uh, a more narrow hypothetical, for instance, the impact you think that your vote might have on GDP. Um, and, you know, I, I would say one reason that your final number there is so large, assuming your math is correct, I'm a journalist and therefore bad at math, fun fact, um, the, it, it is because your initial assumption of zero coronavirus deaths in the United States in the, at, it, with the presence of a different president 
um, I would question that. And this is part of a broader critique that I do genuinely want to make. This is not just me kind of being semantic about it. Um, I think that we tend to overvalue the difference in outcomes between the two candidates as currently available on that type of front. Now, again, Supreme Court nominations, for instance, are a very powerful argument against that point. Um, there are a few other places where I think you can really make that claim compellingly that um, the outcome of the election matters a lot. Um, but I think that there is still, you still need to have your hypothetical somewhere within the bounds of, of realism. And I think that your number is large because your, your kind of denominator there was very, very large. And I would, I would question that one. Even so though, for instance, you know, I think you can look at this, the body of literature about, um, you know, what happens to GDP if you, so there's actually another Brennan who writes on this, Jeffrey Brennan. So I'm sorry to snow you under in Brennan's, but um, there's a great 2011 book called The Ethics of Voting from Princeton University Press um, that, uh, that does this math for GDP growth. It says, okay, let's say your candidate would produce an additional GDP growth of a quarter of a percent a year, right? So that's quite a conservative assumption. Um, but you know, even if you, even if you multiply it, um, they do this additional piece of math, which you didn't do. And I don't know, this may be too arcane to get into in this context, in this forum, but they say, listen, when an election is very close, those slightly shorter odds obtain of your vote mattering, but there, most elections are not very, very close. Most elections have a certain amount of a gap. And that if we say something like the random voter has a 50.5% chance of casting a ballot for the winner um, or, you know, something comparable, that the expected value of the vote then takes a kind of very, very dramatic plummet. And this is, you know, again, something that's a little bit complicated to explain here, but that the one in, you know, one in 10 million or one in 60 million odds, um, depending on what state you're in, are they don't take into account what happens when elections are very close, which is that voting behavior changes. So I guess what I mean to say is, I love the math. I love that you brought me the math. I think that is a really good way of thinking and talking about this. And I agree that when the stakes are sufficiently high, the mathematical argument does break down. But I think a realistic assessment of the trade-offs is important to make. And I am not convinced that you have offered quite the right baseline realistic statistical assessment of the trade-offs. We had lots and lots of models of nations all over the world with many, many different types of leaders, um, many of whom you know, tragically lost many, many citizens to coronavirus. So I'm, I'm hesitant to zero that number out for Hillary Clinton. Yeah, so some people um, argue that political action should, should not stop at voting and there are many other ways to achieve desired policy outcomes such as organizing or um, just doing, um, just acting like kind of more um, in an, in the manner of activism or working in activism. And I guess I'm wondering if you think that they should be um, to combined together or if there's a way to kind of fit that idea of um, kind of organizing in a political way and not voting, or if you think that um, in a way that kind of fits into your framework, or if you think that that idea um, of kind of voting but not stopping at voting and organizing on top of that um, does not fit into your like kind of um, rationale for not voting. Yeah, I mean, I do think, I think if there's one thing, well, we've seen, I was going to say if there's one thing we've learned this summer, but my God, the number of things we have learned this summer, like I can't even begin to make a list. One of the things we've learned this summer is, I think, the power or potential power of even kind of one-off or limited participation in protest. I mean, the, the incredible power of the Black Lives Movement, the Black, Li the Black Lives Matter movement in American cities, the influence that it has had on people's thinking. When you look at polls from before and after the death of George Floyd, there's real movement in those polls. The American people are changing their mind about how to to think about policing, about how to think about criminal justice, about how to think about race. Like this is, this is an example of 
going to a couple of those marches, which arguably is, you know, sort of setting aside a day, going to one march, setting aside a day, the similar kind of investment to voting. I, I think, I think there's some evidence that it can really make a huge difference. And again, you're one individual in a crowd, right? This is still an example where you are making a tiny contribution to a much larger project. And I'm not saying never do a thing where you make a tiny contribution to a much larger project. That would be counter to human psychology, among other things, but also I think not not fully rational. Um, but I, again, I do think there are trade-offs. I think there are trade-offs. And I do think that people who vote, that, that many, many people sort of vote and in addition to physically checking off a box, also mentally check off the box. I have done my thing for politics. I'm good to go for four years or at least two years. I think that's a very, very common American mindset that that is worth challenging um, and that and that every every choice has trade offs, um, including not just activism, but like working during the hour or two hours or day it would have taken you to vote and giving the money to a cause. I mean, there, there are lots of there are lots of ways to think about those trade offs. And, you know, I again want to be clear, these are marginal calculations, right? Like your, you know, your couple hundred bucks that you give to a cause is also a small part of a larger activity. But, um, you know, you have sort of secondary benefits from many of those types of activities, including uh, potentially becoming a better informed participant in the political process. We're now going to transition over into audience questions. The first one is from a student. Will you be voting for the upcoming, upcoming presidential election? Why or why not? I have never voted, I don't think. Uh, I have put an asterisk on it because there's a possibility that I voted in college via a mail-in ballot that somebody like stuck under my nose at a table at a freshman bazaar or something. Uh, and I can't entirely rule it out. I've actually tried to answer this question. Like you can look up voting records. You can look up and see whether someone voted in some states, but uh, I have not been able to fully answer that question for myself. It's a blur. Um, I will not be voting. I will not be voting for all the reasons I just outlined here. Um, if I did vote, I would probably vote for the Libertarian Party candidate, not because I think she's great or because I think the Libertarian Party is great. I think, frankly, the Libertarian Party kind of sucks and keeps sucking in ways that are very systematically annoying for someone who generally shares their principles. Jo Jorgensen is very nice and she will not do very well in the general election. Um, but I, I don't vote for all the reasons that I outlined here. I'm, I actually not to like turn it around and you can feel absolutely free not to answer. But one thing we do at Reason is we ask everyone on staff, we don't insist, but we ask for them to say who they voted for. So we publish every year or every four years, um, the voting, you know, the name and a brief justification for all the writers and video producers and podcasters that you read and watch and listen to. This is our way of helping readers understand our bias. We think that um, that this is helpful information for people to know. Who are these people who are telling me what to think about the news? I want to know how they voted. And so even there, we are using voting as a proxy for other commitments. Um, but you can see me on record saying for many, many years that I've not voted. I, I would be interested to know just uh, from the three fellows here, um, if y'all vote, like what's your number one compelling reason for voting? By answering the question, I do not want to put pressure on either of the other fellows to answer it because I think that they have a total right to privacy. But I am entirely comfortable saying that. Should we go my question and just say none of your darn business because that is also an American right, the right to privacy, particularly in the ballot box. I am very comfortable saying that I think that there is an entirely real chance that American democracy would not survive a second term of Donald Trump. And so I will be sending in my ballot for Joe Biden the day after it arrives at my house. I'm voting um, because I'm voting in a state that might swing either way. Um, and the likelihood of not necessarily my vote, my vote changing anything, but the likelihood of it being close is like pretty high. And I'd like to contribute to the side that I'm choosing to vote for. Like my fellows, I believe that not voting is a collectively harmful activity, so I will be voting. Um, yeah. Will, do you want to ask another question? Sure. Uh, so actually, our next question is picking up on uh, the point that Nandini just made, which is uh, based on the clean hands principle. Uh, so you endorse the clean hands principle, 
and saying that if you can refrain from a collectively harmful act at minor inconvenience to yourself, you should do it. Uh, what if uh, under the same principle, not voting is a collectively harmful act and you can avoid not voting at minor inconvenience to yourself by going to the ballot box. So based on that thinking, uh, should you avoid not voting and therefore actually vote? Right. I mean, the rest of my argument is the answer to that, which is that I don't think not voting is a collectively harmful act. So I, again, I think um, that it would be collectively harmful if our democratic system collapsed. Uh, but I think there is me, me not voting, many individuals not voting is not a threat to the system. And I think that that's apparent because most people don't vote right now and haven't for many, many, many elections prior to this one. Our democracy is chugging right along. Maybe that's an overstatement. Our democracy is continuing to function at a minimally acceptable level, just barely, uh, without full participation, without anything like full participation. Um, and I think, you know, that is, um, that's, that's sort of manifestly true. I, I just, I, I think the idea of non-voting as a collectively harmful act or decision kind of misses the point of that hypothetical. I love the attempted judicial. I am here for it. I like, I love it that y'all are listening and engaging in the argument and doing the like, but what about? Um, so I'm very here for that. I think, um, again, if you have reason to suspect that you will be a low information voter, especially in you know down ballot races, um, that is a compelling reason not to vote. Again, that's a revealed behavior. Lots of people don't vote down ballot. If you if you look at ballots in any kind of um, marquee election year, the further down the ballot you get, the fewer people vote. This is a universal in American elections. It's been true for a long time. Set aside referenda, which take us into even deeper levels of voter confusion and apathy. But that is people recognizing that it's incumbent upon them to not vote at some point when they have no idea which vote would contribute positively. Um, and I would argue that people are just not super, super great at knowing when they are a low information voter, even in those top of ticket races. Um, and of course, there are mechanisms to work around this, including single party voting. You might say like, listen, I don't know much, but I basically know I like Democrats. Um, that's perfectly fine. But I, I think the, re the revealed behavior is that many people recognize that it is a positive act not to vote in a race that you don't think you have something to contribute to the quality of the electorate, both in systematic non-voting on the part of many, many Americans and down ballot non-voting. You just briefly mentioned that we should vote when and if um, democracy falls or whatever. Um, why should we wait for democracy to fall? Why can't we take preventative measures and start voting now? Right, again, it's, it, it's it'd be a very, very specific case that I'm arguing here. So I'm saying both if there is a scenario in which I am the only voter, right? Uh, the PTA election type scenario. And then if I think that, if I think not just that democracy is in danger, but that my non-voting is increasing that danger, that's when it's incumbent upon me to vote. And because of all the other arguments that I just laid out, my non-voting is not imperiling democracy, both because it is mathematically unlikely that my vote will be noticed in any systematic way, in any election will determine any outcome. And also because it's my obligation not to vote when I'm not, when I'm not going to be a well-informed voter. Thank you. I think that was interesting what Nandini said about her reason to vote, thinking that it's um, a collectively harmful thing to do. And it made me think about the electoral college um, and kind of how that really uh, is like a bigger determinant of like who wins the election versus like individual votes. Um, and so like we have a question from a parent um asking if you could talk a bit more about how the electoral college affects the importance of or lack thereof um a vote in a presidential election right so the existence of the electoral college obviously strengthens um, dramatically any mathematical argument for non-voting right so in addition to all the layers of just will my single vote be the vote that tips the election in the simple sense of a of a up or down broad population vote in presidential elections, we have this additional barrier, which is that for many, many people in many, many states, uh, their vote matters substantially less uh, because of the kind of anti-democratic institution that is the Electoral College. I 
live in Washington, D.C., and know a lot of people who have very, very strong opinions about the Electoral College. This is something that you can get into a bar fight about uh, in my neighborhood. And um, I don't have very, very strong opinions about the Electoral College to the extent that I do. Um, I, I don't love it. I think it's, it is a, an additional tool that allows the people who already hold the reins of power to keep competitors out. Um, and there are many tools in our system where the people who already hold their hands of power keep competitors out. Um, and this is, this is one of them. So yeah, I do think the Electoral College quite rightly plays a role psychologically for many people in the question of whether or not to vote because they recognize again on a kind of semi-quantitative but also intuitive level that there is there's a, a, a layer of elite gatekeeping between their kind of basic democratic participation and the outcome, um, and that that further devalues the time they spend voting. Our next question says, you say you're not arguing for voter suppression or literacy tests, but suppose there was a literacy test that did meaningfully predict voter quality, like the citizenship test we already use for immigration purposes. Following your line of argument, how do we resist justifying precisely that mechanism to ensure higher quality voting? And if you do accept that argument, isn't that a reductio ad absurdum? Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, I, I always try to like wave my hands and like bug out my eyes and be really like strongly worded when I say that part about how I think erecting barriers to voting in any form is morally wrong and 100% not what I'm arguing for. I think there are just principles that that like substantially outweigh all of these arguments when it comes to the question of preventing people from voting. We have you know, we have a sense of the rights and duties of a citizen and voting is, is central to that. People fighting for the vote is something that is one of the great heroic stories of our country. Um, and it's not because any individual one of their votes was going to sway the election. It's because having the franchise is part of being a full citizen. And nothing is more important to me than all citizens having the full rights of citizenship. And this is, this is the story of American, of, of American government. Um, if, you, if you want to tell an optimistic story, it's one where more and more people get those rights. I actually think your mention of the citizenship test is really on point. I would like to see the citizenship test go away too. I think that that is equally suspect, you know, to say someone who is here, who wants to be here, who wants to have a life here um, first, let us throw this artificial barrier in your way before you can fully participate in our democracy, that sucks. Um, and that, that is just as morally suspect as a poll tax or a literacy tax, no matter how perfectly designed. And I think we can agree the citizenship te test is not perfectly designed. That thing is a mess. Um, in general, I am very pro-immigration. I think we should be dramatically expanding legal immigration and that all those people should be allowed to vote uh, as soon as possible should they so desire, but maybe they should do something better with their time. So you have said that who wins is important and yet a single vote doesn't affect who wins. So what can be done to affect who wins? Right, so I mean, I think again, this is, this is just the list that we talked about earlier of, you know, people should participate in politics at the level of their own interest and aptitude. So this is, um, you know, this goes all the way from volunteer for a campaign if you think it's important that that person win. Um, I know sometimes campaign volunteers do get out the vote work, uh, which is, uh, you know, which is something that some people value. I would say to the extent that you can have impact on policy uh, and influence people who are already in office, that is likely a better use of your time. Um, that is limited, of course, by how much of a spectrum is available from people who already hold office. There are lots of things I would like to see happen that no one in office is currently advocating, for instance, a dramatic expansion of legal immigration. So um, I think like the, the old classic, write a letter to your congressman thing, like it is astonishing that even in the year of our Lord 2020, like a hundred phone calls to a congressional office matters. It's bananas. That does not make any sense. Like there are many ways to gauge public opinion and what your constituents want and the phone ringing off the hook is not a quantitatively sound one. And yet that is a place where a relatively small use of your time seems to have demonstrable impact on a thing that then happens 
in the United States Congress. Um, so that's a good example if there's something you feel strongly about. Um, and I think the list goes on and on. I mean, again, I'm a political journalist, right? Like I devote all of my time all day to trying to make our politics better. Um, so I think it's really important, but I think some people have other aptitudes and other interests and that they shouldn't be dragged into participating in this if if it's not the, if they don't see it as the best use of their time they shouldn't necessarily be shamed for even not wanting to vote because it may not be the best use of their time or their energies on that day or on any day sorry had to get to the unmute button um the next question comes from a student um and the student is asking if voting isn't that important especially in federal elections what implication does that have um on our democratic system as a whole shouldn't our democracy have important features that actually engage the people so like does that really um what does this say about democracy essentially yeah, I think that's a fair question. I mean, I think it says that that a lot of our self conception as an as a democratic nation is is self is I don't want to say self delusion because that is far too strong a word. We are fundamentally a democratic nation in the colloquial sense of that term, but um, you know, I think arguably one reason that we go to so much trouble to propagandize people to vote to really lean into that is because we want people to psychologically buy into the idea that they consented to be governed in this way. I mean, this gets us back to the Herbert Spencer argument that I cited earlier. If you did vote and you participated and you remember that time that you voted, you must live in a fair and democratic society. You must have consented to this. This must be a good system that you consented to. Um, that's a thing that is psychologically powerful and also the sort of flip side of it if you didn't vote you didn't properly participate in this genuinely democratic society so sit down and shut up um you know that's that's going to like that aligns with the incentives of people who want continued buy-in for the current system and i i also want continued buy-in for the current system at its very basic level but i think it is deeply flawed. I think there are a lot of things really, really wrong with many of the mechanisms of government and that it's imperative on us to change them, but that the act of voting is being oversold precisely in some cases so that people won't march in the streets or call their congressman or whatever it is. They already did their bit. They participated. Um, so yeah, I think it has major implications for our sense of ourselves as a democratic society, and I don't think they're all very flattering. Continuing on that theme that you were mentioning of doing what those in power are asking us to do, uh, a professor asks, we're currently bearing down on an election where one of the candidates is actively working to delegitimize the election, and it looks like he will win only if there is massive confusion about voting. Is arguing against participating in the collective endeavor of holding our government accountable morally risky on that basis? Yeah, I mean, I am not enjoying Donald Trump's absolute garbage in trying to kind of like throw sand in the eyes of this election. It is not good, anonymous professor. I agree with you that this is an upsetting turn of events and something that we should be focused on, uh, on working to minimize and, you know, compartmentalize to the extent that we can. Um, this non-voting argument is one that I have been making for a decade. It is not specific to this election. And I don't think that even tough elections should generally cause us to change our basic underlying ideas about what is moral and what what makes the world work best. And I know that that's a very hard thing to say and to hear, particularly one month before a very contentious and serious election. Like I fully get that. But uh, again, I think the problems with our election system, which Donald Trump is preying on, are not ones that he created. Our elections are already somewhat chaotic and mismanaged. There is some amount of fraud and confusion that is well documented. He is absolutely exaggerating it for his own ends, to be clear. I, I am shocked and dismayed, but I'm going to write about that. I run a magazine where we write about that. 
me going to the polls or not going to the polls is simply neither here nor there on that question. It is a, it is a separate and higher level question from OMG, but 2020 is really bad, even though OMG 2020 is really bad. Concern with your concept of the well-informed voter is that information in America is dispersed on lines of class and race. And uh, what are your thoughts on the well-informed voter being the wealthiest and the widest? So I think that's a good question. And I think that um, in general, people do sometimes use that argument as a proxy for, again, um, you know, restricting voting to elites as understood in whatever given society, I think that's a problem. I think that the safeguard against that is to hold the right of a citizen to vote as sacred and prior to all of these arguments. But I do think that the question of who is and isn't a well-informed voter is a question to be addressed at the level of education, to be addressed at the level of you know, availability of social services is addressed to be addressed at the available of distribution of wealth. Like these are crucial, crucial questions with which politics deals, um, but that even if it is true that the initial allocation of information is unfair, it's, that is not itself an argument for a low information voter to vote as a moral matter for that voter. This is again, not a question of what what people should be allowed to do or what their rights are as citizens, but it is still true that if you are a low information voter, even if it is through no fault of your own, um, that it may be incumbent upon you to choose not to vote in an election and to use that time to remedy, to attempt to remedy systematic injustices or just get by to, to do what you have to do to live. Um, and I think, you know, to say to people again, who are already disadvantaged, it is especially incumbent upon you to go do this thing that will not in the end have any likelihood of influencing the outcome of an election um, strikes me as wrongheaded and unfair. Well, we have many, many more questions from our attendees, but unfortunately we don't have time to get to all of them. We did want to reserve a little bit of time at the end if you have any uh, brief closing comments to leave us with. Sure, I mean, I, I mostly just want to say that these questions have been like, a plus, like so good. I sometimes, sometimes this conversation goes south, uh, and you know, I I always take a good percentage of the blame if that is the case because I think it's so important to have this conversation, even though it's really hard and getting harder, um, because I think I think a lot rides on our beliefs about how voting and our democracy function. And for us as a society to kind of share in what I ultimately believe is a kind of mathematically dubious um, mythology of voting um, is damaging. And so I, I guess I just want to say I really appreciate the questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more of them. Uh, if people want to get at me in my Twitter, uh, you can you can do that or send me an email. I'm just kmw at reason.com. Uh, my Twitter handle is kmangyward. Uh, I love talking about this stuff. I will talk about the ethics of voting all day long. So um, please, um, I would love to continue the conversation with you. And um, and I particularly appreciate the questions from the fellows. I can tell that you guys prepared uh, and came in ready to roll. And uh, and I appreciate that you spent spent that time on me when you could have spent it voting. On behalf of Claremont McKenna College and the Athenaeum, thank you all for joining us tonight. A special thanks to Ms. Mangu Ward and to all of those who sent in their questions. Don't forget to join us at our next virtual ATH event, which will be on Monday, October 5th at 5 p.m. Pacific. Kaylin O'Connor, Associate Professor of Logic and Philosophy of Science at UC Irvine, will join us to speak about the misinformation age. See you all then.